Well, hey, I heard about a man who was kind of a stingy man with his money growing up. He was known for being much of a miser. And right before his death, he asked his wife, he looked at her and said, I have saved, it's in a little wooden box, I've saved $50,000. And he said, I want to be buried with that. Well, his wife was shocked. First of all, they had saved that money and she didn't really know about it. And that led to a little bit of discussion. But since he wasn't in great health, she didn't press it much. But she said, you know, I have a little bit of trouble burying that with you. And... Um, uh, they had to talk about it, and uh, he said, it's, it's my dying request. She said, well, you know, you know, in the afterlife, you're not going to need that. It's like everything is taken care of. It's full service after you leave here, and uh, you don't have to do anything else. But he, he, he would not have it, and he said, it is my last request. I have saved it. I want it buried with me. So she reluctantly agreed. Well, the day of the funeral service came about because as time went on, he passed away. And uh, she was sitting on the front row. And she had made plans. Her, she had a good friend who had helped her plan the funeral arrangements. And during the planning of the arrangements, she had told him about her husband's request. And her, and her friend had said, you don't want to do that. I mean, like, he is going to be gone. He is not going to know. Like, uh, you know, just, you, just, you just take the money. And you're going to need that for your retirement. You're going to need that to get along. And so... She was torn. She looked at her friend. She said, I don't know. Well, on the day of the funeral, they're sitting on there in the front row together. And she has this little box. And her hands are on it. They're kind of shaking a little bit. And she goes to the host service. Well, at the end, people go past the casket to pay their last respects. And it gets down to uh, uh, the wife and her friend. And she gets up. She's holding the box. And her friend is thinking, no, no, no. Do not do it. Do not do it. She takes a step forward. And as she takes a step, she turns and she lays the box on the chair where she had been sitting. She goes up. She can't even hardly look at her husband. And um, not that he could look back or anything. But anyway, she, she can't hardly even look him uh, in the eyelids. And uh, she, uh, <laughs> this is going south. <laughs> you just stick with the story here. Anyway. <laughs> Um, she, she just pats his hand and she goes back to her seat and her friend goes, oh. well, the funeral attendants come up. They begin to close the casket and all the stuff that they do. Well, right before they close it, they've taken the flowers off. They've tucked everything in. Right before they close it, she goes, oh, stop, 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 stop. She goes, I can't. She gets up. She walks with her little box. She kisses the top of his head. She lays the box between his uh, hands and she turns and she walks away. They close the casket. She's sitting with her friend. They roll the casket out. They tell her and her friend to walk behind the casket. As they're walking, her friend leans over to her and says, I cannot believe, surely you did not just bury that money with him. She whispered back. She said, I'm sorry, I did. She said, I'm a Christian. I can't lie. It was his dying request. I told him I would do it. Her friend said, I can't believe you buried $50,000 with him. She said, well, it was, it, it was hard. I put all the money in the bank. So I just I left it there and I wrote him a check. <laughs> Smart lady, wasn't it? <laughs> and in a weird sort of way, that is leading us to where we are in the Sermon on the Mount today, where Jesus says, forgive us our debts. But as we're going to see, he doesn't leave it there. We've been in a series called Upside Down Kingdom because it's really about this upside down kingdom that God calls us to be a part of. A kingdom where the first are last, the last are first, the greatest are the least, and the least are the greatest. It's more commonly called the Sermon on the Mount. It's found in the book of Matthew in chapters 5, 6, and 7. There are a lot of sayings that are pretty famous about Jesus in this sermon, but perhaps none as famous as what we call the Lord's Prayer. If you've got your Bibles, your iPhones, or your Androids, whatever it is where you look up Scripture and you follow follow along. If you want to turn to Matthew chapter 6, that's where we're going to land right about chapter, verse 12 today. And as we've said before, this message or this prayer would probably be more aptly named the disciples prayer because it comes in response to a question from the disciples to Jesus to teach us how to pray. So Jesus, uh, uh, he begins to do that. And he says, well, if you want to know how to pray, if you want to pray like I do, this is how you should start. Jesus says these words, this then is how you should pray, our Father. And if you were with us, you know that he starts with this intimate relationship that we can have. Our father was uh, from the Jewish word. Uh, a lot of people believe it, it to mean daddy. It was that intimate of terms where a, a little boy or a little girl would look up to their father. They would raise their hands as Lindsay said, you know, in the song that we were singing, as if to say daddy. He said, you can approach him as daddy. But then he says, make no mistake about it. It's not just our father, but he is in heaven. And in heaven speaks more uh, not to 
the place where God lives as it does the authority and the power that are at his command. Yeah, he is your father, but man, the heavens belong to him. Then he continues and says, hallowed be your name. If you were with us on that uh, particular Sunday, you'll remember that hallowed came from the word holy or sacred. And it's not just a statement, although it is a statement that holy is your name, hallowed is your name. It's actually, in addition to that, it's the first request of the prayer. It is a request from us to Father for us to live in a way, to help us live in a way that we make his name known, that we make his name sacred on this earth. Then he continues. He continues with what is the purpose, the why of the prayer. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You see, Jesus is not just teaching us how to pray. He's teaching us what to pray for. It's realizing that in this upside down kingdom, that in reality my priorities should be last. It is a prayer of surrender. Surrender. Father, I surrender my name being known to your name being known. Father, I surrender my kingdom and my projects and my water, fill in the blank, to your kingdom coming. Father, I surrender my will being done on this earth to your will being done on this earth. I've heard a lot of people say over my uh, few years growing up in life, uh, and maybe you have too, if you heard people say, well, I want to go deep with God. I mean, I just don't want to be shallow. I want to go deep. And most of the time when people tell me that, it's like, I'm going to take one of those in-depth studies where I've got the colored pencils and I've got this going on and I've got that going on and I circle the words and I go back and who's that pronoun? Or I'll take another class. I'll, I'll go and I'll, I'll do a college course. A lot of times we think of things that gain knowledge, but I'm not sure that that's the thing that really gets us going deeper with God. While all of those things may help with knowledge, I have discovered that nothing will take you deeper with God than truly surrendering your will to His will. There will be no class you will ever take. Take the hardest class you want to on Greek, Hebrew, or Aramaic. I guarantee you it will not be as difficult as surrendering your will to His will. To wake up every morning and say, Today, Father, this day is about you. You help me be last. You put me in a back seat. Whatever contract it is at work today, Father, it is your will being done. If it is against your will, Father, you lead me away from it. Father, I've got a job that I'm going to today, but if it's not your job for me, if they want me to do something that's against your will, Father, help me to stand up and help me to be that light in those dark places. Father, I'm going to school today. Father, I'm going on a date today. Father, would you let your will be done when I'm with that girl, when I'm with that man, when I'm in that school, when I'm on that team, whatever that team decides, Father, I want your will to be done regardless of what the team does. Father, I'm here and I'm living for your will. This prayer is a complete prayer of surrender, of us asking God. And if you want to go deep with God, start praying that. Start living that. It's not that I don't want you to take the class. Take the class. Get your colored pencils. Circle all the stuff you want to and you'll feel here. But if you want to feel here, surrender is the only way it happens. But then the prayer takes a turn. The prayer takes a turn from his name and his power and his will to me. As he continues, give us today our daily bread. And with that phrase, Jesus turns a prayer of surrender into a prayer of dependence. And as we said last week, truth be told, most of us have never really had to wonder where our daily bread came from. But what Jesus is teaching us, if you truly surrender to the will of God, you've got to have a dependence on the will of God. Because what happens when I walk out of that job? What happens when I choose not to be on that team? What happens when I tell that girl no or that boy no? You see, all of a sudden, trust comes into play. And he says, when you have learned to surrender your life, the next thing you have to do is learn to depend on me. Depend on me. It's realizing that every morning when I get up, my attitude for that day is, Father, show me my assignment for today. Show me where to go. Show me what to do. Show me how to live. Let me, lead me to the people I need to meet. Keep me away from the people I don't need to be away, you know, near. Give me what I need, as the psalmist said, for today. Give me neither poverty nor riches, but give me what I need for today. And then we come to verse 12. Where he says, and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. 
Some of your versions, instead of debts or debtors, will say trespasses, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Sometimes if you've ever been in a place and you say the Lord's Prayer, half the people will say debts and half the people will say trespasses. You're like, oh, I don't know which you know, word to say there. But they, they really, they're not the same word. Trespasses, some of your versions will say sins. They speak to the things that we do that are against God. Either that we do against God or that people do against us. The words debts and debtors there, Jesus is using as a metaphor to refer to those things. And it's no accident that Jesus uses these two words. They're often translated sins. They're often translated trespasses because that's the metaphor that these two words refer to. But Jesus intentionally uses a financial term there, debt debtor. And isn't it true that when a person offends you, it is like they created a debt. There's the sense in which someone who, uh, if they've done something wrong to you, they owe you something, don't they? Have you ever heard somebody say the expression, well, they owe me and, can you fill in the blank, an apology. That's right, they owe me an apology. Well, why would they owe you something? Well, they owe you something because of something they have done. In your mind, you think, well, they've done something to me. They've, it's created a debt. They owe me something. You talked about me. You owe me respect. You, you're my employee. You owe me a day's work. Maybe your husband or your wife, they, maybe, maybe they walked out and you've lived a life thinking they owe me the life that I would have had. Whenever someone hurts you, it's kind of natural for us to think in terms of debt, debt, or they wronged me, and now they owe me something. So when Jesus tells us to pray to God and ask him to forgive us our debts, what he is saying is this. When you and I break God's law, when you and I do things that are against the will of our Heavenly Father, when we turn our back on him, there is this sense, Jesus says, in which you have created a debt. In which you are in debt to your heavenly father. We've broken his laws. And on our end, the question becomes, what, well, you know, how do we make it right? We need to make it right. And they, like us, were probably taught to pray for, for forgiveness. Uh, uh, from my earliest days, I, I grew up, I'm going to say I grew up in church. You, you, know, you know what that means? My mother had us in church all the time. And I don't really remember a public prayer that somebody didn't say, forgive us of our sins. I mean, they said a bunch of stuff, but they said, forgive us of our sins. It was kind of a common part of a prayer. I guess I heard it so much that I don't really remember praying prayers that I didn't ask for that as well. That forgiveness was just one. One of those things that in addition to give me, help me, I would like, I would say, Father, forgive me of my sins. Which begs the question, if I'm asking him to forgive me, how, how do we, how do I, how do I pay him back? I mean, do I, do I have this kind of system inside of me that says, well, you know, if I could just do enough right things to make up for the wrong things, then, you know, I could kind of get close to that. Or could I possibly do enough good stuff that would earn me credits with God that would be enough to pay for all the debt that my bad stuff got me into? And uh, I don't know about you, but the trouble I have isn't doing good stuff. Although Paul, I mean, this is not, not really in the message today, but Paul says all the good stuff we do is kind of like filthy rags before Jesus. You know, when you, when you pile it up, there's, really it's... It's not, it's not worth a whole lot. But in the scheme of the American way, when we think of good and bad, we do a lot of good stuff, don't we? I mean, I think I try to do a lot of good stuff. My problem is not that I don't do good stuff. My problem is that as a church, we don't do a lot of good stuff. My problem is I can't quit doing bad stuff. <laughs> Does anybody else suffer from that? Like, I mean, I say I'm going to do good stuff. It's kind of like Paul. I think it's in the book of Romans where he says, you know, the things I want to do, well, you know, heaven knows I, I'm not doing them. And the things I don't want to do, what do I gravitate towards? It's like I, I gravitate towards those things I don't want to do. It's like a bug's life. I've watched that with, with my kids growing up. You know, the two little fireflies, and they're like, don't go towards the light. Don't go towards the light. It's like in my light, I see something I don't need to be doing. And like, I'm walking towards it. I'm walking towards it. I'm walking towards it. And he's like, don't go towards the darkness. Don't go towards the darkness. We're just kind of gravitating gravitate in that direction it's it's just kind of what we do and when he says forgive us our debts implied in that thought is I think this this feeling that that we all have that well if I'm going to ask him to forgive us of our sins if I'm going to ask him to forgive us our debts implied in that is the thought isn't it that he's going to do that 
that he's going to be faithful in that. And wouldn't it be great if the prayer stopped right there? Forgive us our debts. Thank you, Jesus. That's what I wanted. Got to go on. Going to try not to go towards the darkness, but thank you for taking care of it. Jesus says, sorry about your luck, Tom. <laughs> it's not where the prayer ends. Jesus says when it comes to forgiveness, there's more to it than just this vertical relationship with your Heavenly Father. There's this horizontal relationship with me. Tom, this is not you just saying, Father, would you forgive me for the stuff that I've done wrong? That's a good start. But Tom, the prayer that I'm asking you to pray is this. Father, would you forgive me of the things that I've done wrong in the same way that I have forgiven other people who have done me wrong. Now that's a game changer. You know why it's a game changer? Because I can be slow at giving other people the forgiveness that I want to get from God myself. Any of you husbands, how long can you go and give your wife the look? I can go a while. She can tell you. I had to go, I, I won't tell you the circumstances, but one day I was downstairs on the couch. She was upstairs in the bed. But I'm kind of telling you the circumstances. She would kill me if I told you what caused it. So I'm not going to tell you what caused it. But <laughs> I, ended up, I ended up down there and I was in the wrong. And I thought, what am I doing down here? I was down there on the couch with the blanket. And I thought, I grabbed my little blanket. I go back upstairs and I kind of crawled in the end of the bed. And I said, can the big bad dog or something like that come out of the dog house and into the like it? And, and, and she said yes. And then it was fun after that point. But that's a, but that. <laughs> I'm just going to say there are rewards for doing what Jesus asked you to do. That's all I'm going to say. My children are in the room. <laughs> They're grown, but they know it. There's this idea that what Jesus is saying to us, and that what, you know, we've said the Lord's Prayer all of our lives, haven't we? But did you realize what we were really saying? That it seems like a cute prayer. It seems like something I pray, but you have actually been asking Father your whole life, Father, would you help me forgive other people? Or would you forgive me in the same way that I have forgiven other people? Because I realized for a lot of my life, I have said, God, would you forgive me while hanging on to grudges against other people? Father, would you forgive me while, while holding something against other people, while, while giving other people the silent treatment? How many times I said, Father, I messed up. Forgive me while I was still bitter, unforgiving, or holding a grudge. All these years when it comes to forgiveness, I've been saying, God, would you forgive me? In the same way that I forgive my wife. Hmm. It's a game changer. Because I realize I don't always forgive her the way I would like to be forgiven by God. Father, would you forgive me in the same way that I control my anger? Would you control your anger with me in the same way that I control my anger with other people? Hmm. Game changer. Because I don't always do a great job at controlling my anger with other people. Father, would you treat me in the same way that I treat other people? It's a game changer. And Heavenly Father, if I haven't forgiven them, if I'm still holding something over their head, if I'm still giving them the silent treatment, Father, I'm asking you to treat me that way. Knowing that, anybody want to say the Lord's Prayer with me right now? <laughs> it's a game changer, isn't it? Because all of a sudden you realize that the words Jesus said, while it's hard to find a class exactly on those words, they're deep, aren't they? They require a surrender and they require a dependence. And just in case we missed what Jesus was saying, he's going to say one more thing that we're going to talk about right after Easter, but we're going to break for the resurrection next week. But he, he says this, For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But, and I put but all in capital letters because it's, again, a game changer. Here we go. He says, but if you do not forgive others their sins, what do you think he's going to say next? Well, if you do not forgive others their sins, Tom, well, that's okay. Don't worry about it. I know it's hard. You probably got, I mean, they have prayers. No telling what they have done for you. I don't even want to know about it. Don't even tell me. I'm just going to agree with you. They've done something else that may sing, let it go in frozen. But you just hang on, Tom, as long as you want to hang on. He doesn't say any of that. He says, but if you, Tom, do not forgive others their sins, mm, well, your Heavenly Father will not forgive your sins. And I would like somehow to make that more pleasing, to make that more palatable to you. But Jesus doesn't. He just ends it right there. 
He just puts it out there and says, here's what it is. And that's a hard statement from Jesus. But before, so before we move on, let me tell you what forgiveness doesn't mean. Because sometimes we, we confuse these things. Forgiveness doesn't mean that you are saying that what a person did to you is okay. He's not asking you to ignore it. He's not asking you to go around it. He's saying that forgiveness, it isn't pretending that they didn't hurt you. It isn't pretending that there isn't a legitimate thing that that came between you. It doesn't mean you're letting someone off the hook. That's not what forgiveness is. It could mean that you're going to restore a relationship, but it doesn't necessarily mean that because if it was a hurtful, if it was an abusive relationship, Jesus is not saying you have to go back to that. If you look at Matthew 18, forgiveness isn't involved in that. Forgiveness, forgiveness doesn't mean that you become best buddies again. It's not excusing what they did. It doesn't let the offender escape the consequences of their offense. Someone gave me a definition years ago that I wrote down that I've always remembered. Forgiveness is just letting go of my right to get even. It's letting go of my right to get even. It is trusting and trusting and trusting them. To the will of my Heavenly Father. It's praying what's best for them in spite of what they've done for me. And I would love to stand up here and and tell you a whole lot of things about what forgiveness is. But I think sometimes a picture is worth a thousand words. So I would like to show you a picture of forgiveness that I think does a whole lot better than me telling you what forgiveness is. Turn your attentions to the screens. You see, if, when we, prefer to, we prefer to wait until we feel like forgiving. But if we do that, then our lives are dictated by our At the fire department, we work 24-hour shifts. And that particular day, we didn't get hardly any sleep. It was literally like three or four seconds to nod off and to cross the center line and, and to meet the other car. To forgive us. We don't think it's fair. Forgiveness is a choice, not a feeling. I'm supposed to be a helper, the EMT and the paramedic and the fireman. That, that helps in these tragic situations, and here I am, calls this. See, forgiveness makes us victorious. Maybe in your heart, you know the right Two men of service, one a pastor, the other a rookie firefighter, forever bound in tragedy. For them, it's hard to believe over a decade has passed. I can still see it, I can still smell it, the horrendous noise and the glass breaking. When the grief counselor approached in the hospital, Eric Fitzgerald knew his wife, June, was gone, leaving their 19-month-old daughter, Faith, without a mom. Faith's just sitting there playing on the little hospital bed with the the nurse, and of course she sees me and just reaches out. I don't know what she understood, really, but she crawled into my lap, and she just went to sleep. And I was thankful because I didn't have to pretend that everything was okay. I was at the hospital and a police officer came in and he said, uh, I don't know if anyone's told you, but June didn't make it. And then he also told me, he said, and by the way, she was seven months pregnant and the baby didn't make it either. Eric, you had the opportunity to really say to the judge, you know what, I think this guy deserves some hard time. What did you do? I remember somebody said this in a a sermon. In moments where um, tragedy happens or or even hurt, that there's opportunities to demonstrate grace or to exact vengeance. And I chose to demonstrate grace. The men knew of each other but endured their grief apart until the two-year anniversary of June's death. Matt Swatzel had stopped by the grocery store to buy a condolence card for Eric when he spotted him in the parking lot. Eric starts walking out of the grocery store. He starts walking towards my truck. What do you see in the window? He was just, just bawling. Yeah. And um, so I just walked up and I just hugged him. Um, I mean, it, you know, what do you say? You know, something, sometimes things are best said with no words. That hug must have felt like someone had just put a pin in two years of pressure. That was the, uh, the biggest relief I'd ever felt. He just said from the start that he forgave me. And uh, just hearing him say those words, um, 
it just impacted my, my life completely. They talked for two hours that day, and where you might imagine the relationship would end. I said, man, I don't know what you're going to say to this. I said, but I just feel like in my spirit that I'm supposed to stay connected to you somehow. And he's like, dude, I, I feel the same way. We knew it was something special. We just had this instant bond. It's unexplainable. It's just easy to talk to each other. Man, look at that man. deliciousness. We would just talk about life, you know, just how we're doing and just moving forward. And he said, look, don't let this define you. Meeting with Eric, it gave me hope that we're going to be okay. Sports Illustrated, baby. Oh. As the years unfolded, strangers became friends and something even more. I'm witnessing a little bit of a miracle with you two sitting here together. There's a bond that we have um, that's unexplainable. He's like a big brother to me. You know, we have a lot of fun together, you know, as weird as it may sound and, and crazy, but we do. It's, it's unique. I can't say, hey, this is a beautiful story and it's got a great ending. It doesn't. It's nasty. It's real. And it's something that I'm going to struggle with for the rest of my life. Both men view their friendship as a sign from above. Another sign? Years later, Eric remarried and was expecting a child. The baby was born on the same due date as the son he'd lost. Forgiveness is not minimizing the offense. Eric practices what he preaches and raised his daughter Faith to choose love over anger. So next year, that means you're going to play varsity. Most likely. Yeah. I usually just say my mom got in a car accident. I just don't want people to think that Matthew's a bad person because he isn't. He just made a mistake. I just want her to know that she's loved. She's not alone. <laughs> Dang it. <laughs> Throughout her whole life, I'll be there for her no matter what. So just seeing Faith, you know, holding my kids, it puts a smile on my face. It hurts, but it's the cards that we were dealt, and, and now it's our story together. It reminds me that there's grace, and there's hope, and there's good. I mean, June's in heaven, you know, and, and one day, you know, we'll get to all kind of hang out, and so, you know, God's a big God, and uh, I think that's going to be a great day one day. Forgiveness. Letting go of my right to get even. You know, I've got so much more that I wrote down today, but uh, I want to close with what God says. Look at Ephesians 4.32. Be kind and compassionate to one another. Forgive each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. Or let me read just a little bit from the book of Colossians. As Paul was writing this letter to the church there. I'm going to start with verse 6, and when we get to a certain point, we'll go to the screen. Paul's looking at these followers of Jesus, and he says, So then, just as you have received Jesus Christ as your Lord, continue to live your lives in Him rooted and built up in Him, strengthened in the faith in which you were taught and overflow with thankfulness. For in Christ do you know that all the fullness of God lives in bodily form? And in Christ you have been made complete. He is the head over every power and authority that is in Christ. You were made free from the power of your sinful self. And don't you know that when you were baptized into Christ, you were buried with Him and you were raised up with Him because of your faith in God's power. And that same power was shown when God raised Jesus from the dead. And then on the screen, before that time, before the cross, before any of that stuff, before any of this raising words, you were spiritually dead because of your sins and because you were not free from the power of your sinful self, but God. Made you alive. How? Together with Christ. He forgave all our sins. And then he tells the why. <laughs> he says, because we broke God's laws. Each of us. Each of us. He says, we owed a debt. And all of a sudden, Paul refers back to the same language that Jesus uses in this model prayer. He teaches us to pray. A debt that listed all the rules we failed to follow. 
Would anybody like to see that list on your life? Oh, my heavens, I would not. You know, see, there's a difference between standing before God having faith in Him and standing before God having not believed in Him because having not believed in Him, having not accepted Him as my Savior, I hold that list. It's there. It's a legal debt. Somebody's got to pay it. (laughs) But in Christ, oh, what did He say happened? It was a legal debt. That list of my bad, (laughs) a legal debt that stood against me, But God forgave us that debt. How do we pay back? Well, we don't. We don't because he did. We accept. He did the payment. He took it away. And he nailed it to the cross. It is one place that you could say, God, you nailed it. I mean, it is so true. Next verse. He says, put up with each other. Forgive the things that you are holding against one another. Forgive each other. Not because they deserve it. Not because they didn't hurt you. Not because they didn't do something that's wrong. Forgive each other. Why? Well, because that's what God did for you. Because the Lord forgave you. So maybe the question as we leave here today is this. Are you holding something over somebody? Are you seeking something from your Heavenly Father? that you have not been willing to give yourself? Well, maybe a good dose of us saying and contemplating and meditating on the words would do us all a little bit of good. Our Father, who makes His home in the heavens, holy is Your name. Father, Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Father, would You give me for today the stuff that I need, nothing more, nothing less. Give us our daily bread. And Father, would you forgive me and help me remember at those most difficult moments in my life that I forgive other people, not because they deserve it, but because you have in fact forgiven me. So forgive me my debts as I forgive those who have sinned against us. Forgiveness for them, for us, is what hangs in the balance. So when you pray, maybe pray like that. Father, I thank you for loving us. I thank you for being a good God to us. I thank you for challenging us. And Father, I pray as we leave today that we will be a people who, Father, seeks in every way to seek the forgiveness that we have for you. And that, Father, we seek to show that same forgiveness to the people who have hurt us. And because of you, Father, all of us at Northfield say, Amen.